more about best practices about best practices, trends, challenges, and resources when it comes to creating partnerships. If you're joining us from the nonprofit sector, get ready to hear more about what really happens on the corporate social responsibility side of things. And if you're joining us from the corporate sector, we hope that you'll find this conversation insightful and that you'll take away tools and uh, approaches that our panelists use to uh, approach partnerships. I wanna start with a land acknowledgement. So as we gather in this virtual space, we recognize that we're all connected with one another through a variety of different ways. And we acknowledge that the ground beneath us, beneath our feet is historically the home of indigenous peoples. We at V2I work and live on Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and traditional lands of the Mi'kmaq people. If you know the land you're joining us from today, please tell us in the chat along with your name as a way to introduce yourself. If you don't, we encourage you to learn more about the original land and people where you are joining from today. And we are sharing a resource in the chat that might support you on your learning journey right now. If we haven't met, my name is Fadi and I'm the co-founder and executive director at Venture to Impact. Venture to Impact is a nonprofit organization that uses design thinking to solve complex challenges by linking global communities to skilled volunteers. We leverage untapped skills to create lasting impacts. Through education, economic development, and empowerment projects, we work to equip NGOs, participants, and volunteers with skills, resources, and knowledge to advance gender equity, economic opportunity, and well being. And we're hosting this conversation today to support more partnership and collaboration in our sector and to celebrate this year's Pro Bono Week. We are grateful to all the amazing participants, volunteers, partners, and corporate professionals that we get to collaborate with on a regular basis. During this session, we wanna hear from you. So please add your thoughts, your comments, or your questions into the chat. Another way to add your questions is through the Q&A button. And this allows folks who have the same question to upvote. We're going to introduce our panel in a few moments um, and keep in mind that we're going to keep the conversation to the general experience, needs, trends, and priorities of corporate social responsibility and CSR professionals. If you want to learn more about our panelists or about specific company programs, you can check out the event program which has been sent out via Eventbrite, and we'll also link to it in the chat here. Additionally, we're happy to share the tech and data for Good Landscape Database. This is a living document categorizing and detailing the Tech for Good Symposium member companies, uh, which all companies here are, uh, and data for good initiatives alongside contact information. So we're gonna, drop an Airtable link here for you to access the, the database. And to learn more, we're going to offer you an email where you can reach out to the, the group directly. So at this point, I would like to welcome all of our panelists to this conversation. So welcome everybody and thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, we will start with quick introductions and then we'll jump into the conversation. So uh, maybe we'll start with an introduction with uh, Alyssa. Alyssa, would you mind kicking us off, please? Thanks so much, Fadi. I am delighted to be here. My name is Alyssa May and I sit on the philanthropy team at Salesforce. My role centers around supporting our employees to get involved in the community, however that shows up for them. So. I have a team that we do that across the country and across the world. And um, yeah, I'm really excited for this conversation. Thanks. Great. Uh, Brittany, would you like to go next? Thank you. Yes. Hi, Brittany Werfitz here. I run Dell's Tech Pro Bono program. So um, overseeing all of our skill-based volunteering programs at Dell Technologies. Really excited to be here to have this conversation. I think um, 
obviously I know you've received our bios in advance, but uh, before joining Dell, I worked in the nonprofit space and in international development and emergency humanitarian response. And I know that sometimes there's a, a significant gap, gap that can feel a little bit daunting um, bridging these sectors. So excited to try to shed a little bit of light today. Thank you, Fadi Venture to Impact for, for having me. Great, and Madeline? Hey everyone, I'm Madeline Hutchinson. I'm really excited to be on this panel today with so many good friends in the, in the Tech for Good space. Um, and I'm at JP Morgan in a group called Tech for Social Good, where we lift up communities around the world through the power of our people, which is 50,000 technologists globally, and our technology um, to help serve nonprofits and communities around the globe. So really excited to be here in this conversation um, with you all today. Thanks, Maddie. And last but not least, Miriam, would you like to introduce yeah. yourself? Sure, thanks, Maddie. Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It's a pleasure seeing in the chat folks joining from all over the world. My name is Miriam Becca. I use the pronoun she, her, and I'm the Senior Manager for Social Innovation at VMware, which is a virtualization multi-cloud SaaS company based out of Palo Alto in California. Um, so with leading our social innovation programs, I'm primarily focused on nonprofit digital transformation. So exploring how we can leverage our resources as a company, our employees, our products, as well as our financial resources to support nonprofits along on their digital journeys. And similar to Brittany, I also come from the nonprofit sector and um, in, in my role at uh, the International Conflict Resolution Nonprofit I worked at, um, I actually managed a couple of partnerships with technology companies and was so curious about why they chose us and how they managed our partnership that it became one of the driving reasons uh, for my joining the, uh, the corporate sector and being on this side of it. So really excited for this conversation and thank you, Fadi, for uh, convening such, such a wonderful group of panelists. Absolutely, my pleasure. And I think we're, I would like to start is at the 30,000 foot level, which is a question that we get a lot. And uh, the question is, what is the best place to start with a corporate partnership? Is it asking for funds? Is it offering a volunteering opportunity? Is it going in for a lunch and learn? Where should an organization that's seeking corporate partnership consider starting? Uh, maybe Alyssa, do you want to start with that question? Sure, I can take a stab. Um, so maybe it might be helpful if we kind of looked out and laid out the variety of ways that a partnership may be forged or formed um, in our space together. I think there are different ways that it can be formed and I maybe can walk us through them. So the way that I envision it is kind of a funnel um, so at the top, there is a much higher likelihood that you're going to be able to have a robust partnership and kind of as you get towards the bottom, um, that's kind of a lower likelihood of partnership there just because it becomes a little bit more um, focused and detailed. So when you ask where's the best place to start, I'd recommend starting at the top of this funnel and where the top exists in my mind is engaging employees. That's at the basic kind of foundation of the best way to get involved. When you heard from Maddie that there are 50,000 people, like all of our companies have a huge number of employees and how you can involve them is in volunteering and your matching programs. And that's going to, going to multiply in terms of the reward and the power that that brings to the work that you're doing with them. I would say, as you go down the funnel, there's a little bit more focus in kind of the skills-based employee space. So um, that's looking at, at employee-specific skills and engaging them in the work that you're doing and scoping projects and um, supporting the work that you do in the, in the space with uh, the skills that are available at our companies. And then as you go down, there's typically kind of the smaller grant programs um, that, we, that we manage, that our teams manage. Um, so those aren't kind of the giant strategic grants, but we might have some granting that we're able to do in the community here and there. And then at the bottom of that funnel really is a strategic partnership. And those are very few and far between. Um, 
At Salesforce, we have you know three to five that we're managing at any given time. That usually includes a pretty large financial commitment, but also a volunteer commitment there too. Um, so best place to start is kind of building that, that powerful community of employees at the top of the funnel and building the commitment to your cause. So there's a lot of power and kind of sustainability that is built in there that can come from developing those relationships. But curious to hear um, if my fellow panelists have anything to add there. Yeah, for sure. And you know, one thing that this reminds me of is my first presentation at Salesforce was in 2013, and I really didn't know what I was doing. And then I left the presentation and someone said, send me your slides and I'll add them to, to Chatter, which was the communication platform at the time internally. And then within 24 hours, we're getting volunteers from Australia saying, hey, I saw your volunteer program. Can we get involved? We're getting volunteers from New York, getting volunteers from San Francisco, all the places that I hadn't been to at the time, reaching out. So I, I love that idea of starting with, with the volunteer. Um, Brittany, do you have any thoughts uh, on this question as well? Yeah, thank you. Um, so first of all, I want to say I agree with everything Alyssa said. Um, obviously, we do have limited bandwidth to support a lot of nonprofits at that strategic uh, partnership level. So I echo the comment that we should really start with volunteers first and foremost when possible. So first of all, I'd say you know what volunteers you already are receiving, right? Look into the data that you're already collecting on your volunteers and look at what companies they're coming from. And that might help you to know who you might be able to reach out to to help you either advocate for yourself within a company or learn more about the company's strategic priorities. Um, so on that note, I will say do your research, right? If you do have an opportunity to engage with a team member or even uh, to engage with um, someone from our CSR team or our, in our case, global giving and volunteering team, you know, come already aware of what their strategic priorities are. Look at their latest CSR impact reports not just you know going off of marketing campaigns or what you know the technology the the excuse me the company to be known for right i know adele technologies obviously people associate us specifically with with hardware with computers right but we have team members over 150,000 team members all over the world that do all sorts of other things and so there's a lot of other ways that we engage and a lot of specific priority areas that you might want to be familiar with right and in our case our Three priorities are healthcare, education, economic opportunity. Um, but there are other things we do if you don't fit into some of those categories. So that's something to really um, try to dig into and understand. I'll also say that um, you know, if you are not already familiar with uh, where you stand in terms of our internal donation platform, um, you should look at how you might get vetted or, or update your existing profiles in those donation platforms. I'm gonna drop a couple uh, examples that my fellow panelists suggested as well in the chat. Um, but there's a number of different tools you can use and that we use as, as a corporation to do our donations. So whether that's employees doing their direct donations for a campaign or cause area they care about, um, looking to leverage match funding programs that we make available, looking for suggestions of volunteer engagement opportunities for them. We use these tools internally to help us select nonprofits. And when a nonprofit is recommended to us, we might go look them up in that tool. And if all we see is your name and your um, charity ID or EIN number and nothing about you, nothing about what you do, your profile is really incomplete, we're really likely to move on because we get so much interest from so many nonprofits all over the world doing incredible work. But be an advocate for yourself by filling that out. And so I think those are a few of the things that I would definitely recommend as a starting point. That's a really great starting point. And I think um, what I'm curious about too is what do you think are some misconceptions that nonprofits have about corporate that may be not accurate or may not be fully accurate? Um, Maddie, do you want to take a stab at that question? Sure. Yeah, happy to jump in here. I think you know, similar to a lot of the, the nonprofit partners who are on the line, um, 
a lot of the corporate social responsibility teams or the teams that we all sit on in our organizations are also small but mighty teams. Um, and I think sometimes when you're coming um, to an organization with a name like Salesforce, Dell, VMware, JP Morgan, you might be thinking, wow, there's going to be a lot of manpower and money and, and resources behind you know, the work that we do. And, and while there is, I think a lot of the work that we center around in the social impact space, um, there's a lot of red tape that we too have to go through um, in order to engage with partners. So I think one of the biggest misconceptions I hear a lot is, you know, an understanding or a thought that there's a lot of um, time and, and people and resources behind the programs that we have and that we can kind of make things happen, anything that, you know, is thrown our way, which isn't always the case. Um, and just like you all, we have to, to fight for the programs that we want to do um, as well. Another thing that I think is um, a lot of nonprofits, especially for JP Morgan, will come to us not even knowing what we can provide because they only think about the money and the products that we have. And um, I think doing some initial research on company websites, like we all the organizations represented here have their CSR initiatives on their websites check it out because I think there's a lot more to um, partnership and engagement than just what's at the surface level um, and what we're able to offer. So I think, you know, understanding the, the resource capacities and constraints that we have um, and also doing a little bit more of a re research into what we're able to offer aside from just funding and, and, um, and our products, I think will really help you go deeper in that relationship with, with organizations and find ways to connect um, um, maybe then what you were initially thinking. And, and Miriam, this is kind of a personal experience for you too, because you switched from the nonprofit side to the CSR side. So what myth, you know, myth, myths or ideas were busted for you once you got into the CSR side um, for you to discover? Maddie, Maddie hit a lot of those right on the head. I think one of the first myths that was busted for me was um, just kind of a misunderstanding of what teams looked like and how they were structured. So seeing that, you know, the team that I joined had two other people on it at the time. So we're a three person team in a 35,000 person company. <laughs> um, and then also kind of misconceptions around our budgets and what our grant making budgets are. And I would say the core of that for me personally came from my experience with more traditional grant makers, so like foundations or governments, who's, you know, they have whole businesses that are just around that. So foundations just do grant making. Governments have entire agencies that just do grant making. And so I came in, you know, thinking that corporations would have very similar structures. But taking it back, um, I also love Alyssa's funnel. Um, of kind of, you know, best ways to start your engagement because the very bottom of the funnel for most of our companies is those strategic partnerships. And so I thought for me, like, oh, they're all like strategic partnerships or grant making, but to, you know, to what Maddie was saying, there's a lot of other kind of creative ways that you can think about engaging with, with companies. So um, would encourage you as you start to build those relationships with employees and then slowly with the teams to kind of think creatively about what are the other ways that those companies can serve and support you beyond, you know, kind of traditional grant making and funds um, and their product. I think one thing that you said that stood out to me and, and uh, you probably didn't even notice it was as you start to build relationships with employees and slowly with the teams. That is completely my experience. We've worked with hundreds of Salesforce employees before we had a chance to speak with anybody at the CSR. And, and, and that's really great because the buy-in, the interest, the uh, commitment from employees was totally there. And when we ended up speaking with the philanthropy team, there was just so much excitement because we're all building towards this really fantastic relationship with employees. So this kind of slow burn idea really resonated with me. And I'm not even sure if you were, if you intended to kind of place that in the sentence, but it, it was my experience for sure. Um, so we're gonna take a quick pause and get to know the people in the webinar, in the room. 
uh, quickly. So we're just gonna throw a poll up for you all uh, because we wanna hear where are you joining us from? So let us know if you're coming from the nonprofit or the corporate sector. Awesome, so it looks like 74% uh, of those who are joining are from the nonprofit sector and 21% are from the corporate sector and 5% are from others. Welcome other, not really sure what that means, but would love for you to tell us in the chat if, uh, if you want. And uh, yeah, really excited to, to learn a little bit about who's in the room. Um, I think the next kind of topic that I want to move to is some of your best cross-sectoral experiences. You know, when, what, what comes to mind for you when we talk about highlight experiences across the corporate and nonprofit sector? Uh, Brittany, do you have any experiences specifically that come to mind for you? Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, and I'm going to... Um... I'm going to drop a link in the chat as well as another resource that I think would be relevant to share here. Um, and this specifically is a um, digital assessment tool that we co-developed, or, or I shouldn't say we co-developed, but we co-invested in alongside uh, VMware and Okta. Um, and that is to help nonprofits really understand where they stand on the digital transformation spectrum or, or dig digital readiness spectrum. Um, and I think it's a really interesting tool, but also a good example of kind of a cross-sectoral collaboration, right? Um, TechSoup is themselves a nonprofit organization. They are also a platform that technology companies like my, like Dell Technologies, like VMware and others use to sell their products at a discounted rate for nonprofit organizations. So already really a great tool for nonprofits to be aware of in terms of somewhere you can go to look for hardware, software, uh, other services as well. Um, but also, it's a really interesting example of a tool that can really be transformative for nonprofit organizations at scale, right? So not just one investment where we're working with one nonprofit in a strategic way, but something that's catalytic and can, can reach a lot of um, different nonprofit organizations and have kind of enduring value in that way. So um, that's an interesting example. TechSoup uh, did tons of research and worked really closely with a, a lot of nonprofit organizations to really form and create or inform, I should say, this um, concept. So um, I want to make a plug for that. Uh, thinking, uh, is there issues with volume? I hear people. Okay. Um, sorry, I get distracted by the chat. But um, and that's an example. I think some of the other examples that I, that come to my mind um, are specific kind of projects that we've done with different organizations like the Women's Peace and Humanitarian Fund, um, the organization A21. Um, in both cases, we were trying to leverage technology, and I don't want to get too lost in the weeds of what each project did, but in both cases, we were trying to leverage technology to um, again, help them have greater impact and reach with the, the beneficiaries or the groups that they work with. And one reason that I think both of those are, are interesting examples is because they themselves are organizations that then go and educate and support and work with other organizations. So again, that opportunity to have um, a greater impact than just when you work one-to-one. -one. And so I think those are some of the themes that come to my mind, right? Um, catalytic impact or reach, um, ability to collaborate uh, really meaningfully, like that holistic approach to partnership in both of those cases. Um, our Dell Technologies volunteer teams, the other corporations that we worked with, including um, uh, Pivotal, uh, uh, now Tanzu, uh, is subsidiary of VMware, I'm going to get the name wrong, but um, they worked alongside with us in one of those projects. And um, you know, it was really interesting just to see how we were able to engage from a volunteer perspective, from a donation perspective, from a product perspective, right? Lots of different layers of engagement over time that made those really meaningful and, and enduring in terms of uh, value. And I wanna add on this question from, from a question from the chat, which is in, in, in your previous kind of a volunteer or cross-sector partnerships, how have you taken in mind the sustainability 
of the project beyond the volunteer time because some of the organizations on the line are saying well you know we might be small organizations the volunteer is is not an employee so they're not going to last forever and then what happens so how do you think about this idea of coming in into the organization elevating their uh their skills but then building sustainability as well um, throughout the the kind of area that you're building capacity and this is for anybody i'm happy to jump in here i think one thing that we've thought about in tech for social good at jp morgan is obviously leveraging sustainable tools um so whenever we do a a tech build, we're using technology from a lot of the partners on the line who have, you know, reduced or free licenses. So from a financial standpoint, it's sustainable, but also um, from a user standpoint, it's sustainable as well. And I think that's a key to success um, and making sure that we're building alongside um, the nonprofit in a solution that's not only going to be something that can help them in the immediate um, time frame, but also in the future. And I think one key component to any project, whether it be tech or an operational challenge you're solving, is that time to have handover and training and um, time for questions and keeping that open dialogue. I think that comes with just obviously having more time for the volunteers, but also strategically upfront, making sure that the right people are in the room. So from a nonprofit standpoint, you know, who are going to be the individuals at your organization who are going to implement um, or help to um, carry forward whatever this, this project is that you may be working on with the corporations. Um, I think getting them in the room at, at the start will really help to make sure there's that buy-in, understanding, and they can be there along the way um, to maintain and sustain the solution after those corporate volunteers may have to step away. And, and one of the questions that we're, we're getting in the chat a little bit, and, and we were also thinking about as we were approaching this conversation was, are there specific qualities that you typically look for in a nonprofit partner? Are there things that make a nonprofit partner stand out or make them more qualified or interesting or uh, appealing to to partner with Alyssa do you have any specific criteria because I know that you work with a lot of different nonprofits in your role sure, I can that's a, a great question I was just going to add on to something that Maddie said okay. I, I agree completely with everything that she um, shared I would just add that one of the things that we're really looking to to encourage at Salesforce is building long-term relationships so um, there are incentives built in currently to our current structure that incentivize employees to not just stay on for a short amount of time, but to build a long-term relationship with an organization. I was just talking to an employee this week who I found out has been working with an organization, giving them pro bono support for the past five years. And that's, that's his volunteer commitment and that is what he loves. So, and that is the citizen philanthropist in my mind, and that's how I want all of our employees to behave. Um, I don't, you know, we're, I don't think we'll we'll get there, but it's something that we're really trying to encourage is those long-term relationships. So um, there are times that it is a short stint, but I think you can scope for that and you can prepare for that, like Maddie said, and then um, also build toward those longer relationships. But back to your question, Fadi, what are the qualities um, that I'd be looking for? So when I what you know, as I think about this, there are qualities that really I look for in anyone, um, not just in a nonprofit partner. There are just some characteristics that are more behavioral than anything else. Um, for us, the given is always going to be, and I think Brittany brought this up earlier, is that our programming aligns with you know, the focus areas that we have, and that's going to be at the foundation. But from there, I lean really heavily on characteristics like responsiveness, um, having a growth mindset, sense of humor is huge, um, being flexible, adaptable, um, being able to, you know, write and communicate very succinctly and in a really um, clear way. Um, and transparency is huge in, in the development of these, these relationships. And so those are some of the characteristics that I look for um, in the partners that I'm working with. So. Um, I think 
yeah, they're mostly behavioral. And like I said, I don't think it's, it's, it's limited to a nonprofit necessarily, but just like in my world and in my life more so than anything else. Um, but would love to hear if others have thoughts. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to jump in there and add a little bit. I agree again. I think we all are very aligned in a lot of our experiences and, um, you know, criteria that we use. But um, uh, I think having, in addition to just, you know, transparency, a holistic approach to partnership, really, again, thinking beyond the device, being open and interested and engaging as a true uh, thought partner is really important to us. Um, I would add as well, um, having a clear understanding of the expectations and timelines. I know that, you know, engaging with us on a volunteer uh, centered um, engagement is not uh, necessarily going to be straightforward for you. It requires time commitment and it requires your own investment. And so ability to support that volunteering mechanism is important on, on the, the volunteering side of things. Um, ability to report on impact is also really important. Like, can you demonstrate and show not just number of beneficiaries or number of activities, but really speak to enduring impact and value, I think is something we're gonna look for. Um, again, assuming you align with our strategic priorities and we're at that kind of lower level of that pyramid again. Um, at the higher level of the pyramid, are you vetted? Are you in those databases we're looking to use? Do you have, um, you know, do you meet those basic criteria for us to give you match funding to, for volunteers to, to log hours with you and for us to highlight you in campaigns and things like that? And, and one question that we're getting as well that was uh, asked um, and it was upvoted by two people was that sometimes the contact information of specific CSR people are not listed on the website. So what's the best possible way to engage them? And if I can maybe summarize what I heard a little bit uh, specifically from um, Alyssa based on like the the trying to build a repeatable approach to volunteering is, is CSR is trying to establish the parameters and the uh, maybe policies that allow volunteers to go out and explore how to engage with, with, with nonprofits and how to really kind of um, support those nonprofits on a consistent basis because they have the flexibility and support from their companies to do that. And so their question becomes maybe how do we approach volunteers rather than um, CSR people? And I'm happy to jump in and give some ideas because we've approached a lot of volunteers a lot of random ways. We have meetup pages in a lot of different cities where we do meetup events and we end up meeting people. And these people have come across the world to volunteer with us in physical spaces because they've met us and they like the lunch and learn that we did. And they've met um, a, different a different set of volunteers that have told them positive things about the experience with us. They, um, our mailing list it continues to attract people, LinkedIn and hashtags, um, and just being strategic about the, the, the types of stories that we tell allow us to engage with target volunteers. But um, I just wanted to jump in and summarize because that seemed like a, a nonprofit question, like how do you reach volunteers? Uh, but are there any other thoughts on this question that, um, that anyone would like to share? I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head, Fadi. I think to that question is, you know, what we've kind of been alluding to all along is really you start with the employees and you build the relationship there. Um, you're not going to see our names listed on a website. Um, there are hundreds of thousands of nonprofits in the world um, that would open us up to some um, really interesting uh, workload if we, you know, if we did that. So really it's building those relationships with the employees is where you're gonna to wanna to start. And then the employees know where, where we are, they know how to find us, they know how to reach us um, and they will surely engage us when, um, you know, when, when they think, when they, have, they need help, when they need support with leveraging their, their benefits or their, you know, what they have available to them at the company. And that's how we came to Fadi and he, he described his, you know, his, his experience. Like 
he's been working with Salesforce for a number of years. I had no idea that that was happening. And I have no idea a lot of the relationships that are being built out there in the community. And that's the beauty of it all, really. Like I shouldn't know, and I should trust that our employees are really building sustainable and amazing relationships. So yeah, just to continue on that thread. And uh, maybe the, the conversation now can potentially move into uh, mistakes that you've made with previous nonprofit um, partners or in previous partnerships that you've had in the community. And what did you learn from them? So, you know, we're demonstrating this growth mindset idea here of uh, really kind of saying, hey, we're not perfect. We, we all make mistakes, but we take the time to learn from these mistakes and to really kind of reflect on them and set, um, you know, policies or procedures to move forward and, and take uh, those kind of mistakes or ideas forward into account. So. Does anyone want to take that question? I can start here, um, but I'm sure everyone has some great ideas. Um, one of the biggest challenges I've seen in the past that I hope we can squash um, after this call is the um, sometimes fear from our nonprofit clients to raise a hand or call us or um, escalate when things aren't going maybe as planned. I have heard in the past from some clients that they're just so grateful for the opportunity to be able to work with our employees and engage with us. And they don't want this to affect any, you know, future grants or um, funding or volunteer opportunities. So we're just going to let this go on and it's maybe not meeting our expectations, but we'll just get through it. And honestly, that's a waste of time for your employees and um, taking you away from the important work that you're doing and serving your communities and constituents. And it's a waste of time for our employees too, because the idea is that we want to provide engaging experiences that actually help you move your mission forward and help you to engage with your constituents deeper and have a bigger impact. So um, in the past, we've learned from that and, and trying to keep that door open both ways um, in terms of transparency and making sure that um, we're, we're speaking up when it's not going as planned um, so that we can course correct and get on the right path so that um, we can make an impact and it's something back to sustainability that you know, you're know you able to um, continue to engage with us and other partners and continue to use these, um, these platforms or, or products or um, engagement opportunities um, with us in the future. I can Thanks, add to that. Oh yeah, I'm here. Yeah, I can add to that as well. I think um, it's on on a similar thread to to what Maddie started there. For us, it's really around trust and investing and building trust with the organizations that we work with. So the transparency, the responsiveness, um, you know, the respect, uh, and you know, I think something that I've I'm very conscious of uh, kind of transitioning sectors as well are the power dynamics that exist. And so one thing, a lot of our uh, we, I don't, we don't even usually call them partnerships, but a lot of our engagements with nonprofits happen through uh, our employees, especially through pro bono partnerships. And one thing that we kind of work on a lot, um, we don't call it this as explicitly, but it's kind of like, like squashing the savior mentality. <laughs> so I don't really call it that, but really thinking about how to enter these engagements from a place of humility and um, with an intent to learning. Um, and taking what we call a customer centric approach, which is really kind of, you know, inspired by human centered design. But um, I think that links back to the earlier conversation about how to ensure sustainability of this work is really understanding the organizations, um, their unique constraints, you know, what their resources will be over time and how, how work that we have with them can be sustainable. Um, so that's been a really key part in, you know, the, um, I guess those are the learnings that came out of it, the mistakes that happened, you know, when we're not following those things is, you know, we've had, you know, a project where we've gone down um, to like a pretty, we, we like went pretty deep down into the project and then uh, found out a senior leader at the organization was not supportive. So from our end, making sure that we have buy-in from everyone at the organization before diving in and getting like three fourths of the way done and then realizing like, 
it doesn't have full support throughout and it might not go through. So that's one thing. Um, another one we've had is, you know, a team that has wanted to go into a nonprofit that had like, I think they had a four person staff and operating budget of less than a hundred thousand a year. And they wanted to help them build like a blockchain ledger to track their volunteers. And I was like, they, they don't have an IT person, you know, how are they going to manage this? How are they going to sustain it over time? And so I call that the shiny object syndrome of like, you know, with good intent wanting to go in and like do this really cool shiny project and realizing that might not be exactly what they need and that might not be sustainable over time. So um, those are some examples of the mistakes. And then, you know, the learnings coming from that are really investing in trust and taking uh, kind of a human centered approach. Plus one to the human centered approach. We've tried a lot of different approaches at B2I and unless your program is rooted in em empathy, uh, and rooted a lot of different partner conversations, it's, it's really gonna miss the mark. So I really love that. We're, we have a follow-up conversation, follow-up question from the chat, which is how would you recommend nonprofit have honest conversations uh, when the power dynamic is skewed towards the corporate funders? So I even experienced this of like, oh my God, there's a lot on the line for me. Something isn't sitting well, but, uh, or, or something is getting derailed a little bit, but I don't know how to approach it and I don't want to be the difficult person or the nonprofit that's always raising red flags. And so this question is both from me and Stephanie. How do you recommend we have these difficult conversations? Oh my gosh, this is such a good question. <laughs> This is such a good question. And, you know, while I kind of noodle on maybe some more concrete thing, the first thing that came to mind for me is something that we've talked about a bit already on this call is the relationship building. And, you know, I think another big misconception I had coming into corporate was that especially like thinking about technology companies is that they're these kind of monoliths, like Google is this or Facebook is this and then realizing that they're actually just a whole bunch of humans working in these businesses making decisions every day um, and so I think for for me it's thinking about how can I start building relationships with the humans within these organizations um, and you know feel like I can trust them and say things like that like you know and and I think that there's there's a variety of things that a nonprofit organization might want to um, not disclose from a potential funder or a corporate partner. Um, and, you know, whatever that is, I think as you start to build trust, you can start to kind of gauge what might be the right opportunities to share like, hey, we actually have like, our data is a mess. <laughs> like, I don't want to share that with you because it's a big liability, but we really need help there. And most of the time, whenever you've built those relationships, the people are going to want to help you. They're not going to like, you know, use that against you or be like, or try to change something. So um, that's kind of where I would start. I know it's maybe it's not as concrete, but it's a very good question. I think it's systemic. So I would kind of start with the individual relationship thing. And then hopefully we can do more together at a systemic level to, to address some of those power imbalances. Thanks, Miriam. Any other thoughts on this question? Yeah, I'd love to jump in. Um, and first of all, great question. It's a really tough one. So I don't think that we're going to, you know, fully unpack that here. Um, but I do agree with everything Miriam said. I want to also just flag one other thing is, is that I think um, the question itself roots on the idea that one of our corporations is going to completely change your nonprofit or your experience. And I think that that's not true. I think that goes back to the misconception that we just have tons of money and tons of devices or tons of access or and power, which, you know, I understand why that, that understanding is there, but, but in the reality of the way we do our giving and volunteering and how we put these programs up to be employee centered programs, um, that's not true. We're all replaceable. There's another corporation, if not us, there's another one that does something similar or does something else, right, that could help you. 
So I think you have to take some of that power away from, from us when we're having that conversation. And, a, you know, really just like you would in a job interview, right? And you try to turn the interview on the interviewer, you should be trying to ask the corporation why they should be so lucky as to partner with you. Line up, know what you need in advance and only look for that, right? And, and figure out, again, that holistic approach to partnership and not just trying to tell us what you think we want to hear to give you what you are trying to get, right? Um, so I think we just have to figure out a little bit how to unsettle that balance and that perspective in the first place. Um, again, I know we talked about this already. We're trying to do that behind the scenes, the way we build these programs, the way we bring in people with expertise in the sector to develop these programs. But we also need you as the nonprofit uh, partners, or beneficiaries, recipients, however you want to frame it, to help do that on the back end, right? We can do as much as we can to make sure our volunteers are educated about uh, white savior complex or like Western, you know, promoting Western ideals in, in certain contexts. But we also need you to voice your needs on the back end and make sure you're approaching partnerships with us collaboratively and not just us coming to you like we would a paying customer, completing a project and bringing it back and delivering it and handing it off. You know, we want to partner with you in thinking through the sustainability, the needs, all of the different elements. So I just, I would add that, um, you know, if we can just try to reassess like the way we approach our partnership conversations altogether. I'll just add, if I can, I mean, in complete agreement with my fellow panelists, the only other thing that I would add there is, and as you've heard from um, most of us or not all of us, we've been in your shoes. We all come from the nonprofit sector. Um, I did, you know, there's, I longer, like 10, 15 years um, working in the nonprofit space. So we are on your side. We are here rooting for you and we want the partnership to be successful at the end of the day. So um, I'm, you know, I want you to, your partnership with our employees to thrive and to be the best that it can be. And that's why I'm here really to be able to do that. So um, to Brittany's point, we surely are working with employees to enable them and to help them to understand some of the dynamics that exist in the nonprofit world. But I think um, our experience in this space really helps to facilitate and build the relationship and just know that we're rooting for you. We want it to be to go well. We want it to be a thriving relation and robust relationship. So that would just be the other thing that I'm that I'd add. And and what uh, sorry, Maddie, were you gonna jump in? No, I was just going to share one really, really tactical thing. Um, pick up the phone or get on a Zoom call um, to have these conversations. I always think um, any tough conversations, but especially this um, type of, you know, transparency needs to be done face to face as much as possible. So um, really tactical, but definitely don't send over email. Um, try to get on the phone with with the relationship managers. Sure, it's so tactical, but it's so important too, because like tone, body language, graciousness, curiosity, all these things show up in a phone conversation and might be missed in an email. So really good point. Um, I think the other question that like people are trying to figure out is what are the challenges of a CSR professional? Like what's on their mind? Like we know that you have smaller teams and you're supporting a lot of employees and you don't have the capacity to speak to a lot of other NGOs. Are there other things that we should be thinking about when we think about approaching you or uh, having that kind of CSR engagement conversation, whether, whatever the conversation looks like? I'm happy to start here as well and then um, hand it over to my co-panelists. Uh, so the first one is um, probably something that you know, I, I think is something we've Im implied is that uh, we tend to be pretty small teams and we have many competing demands and stakeholders, like anyone working in the social sector, or just anyone in general. And so as we think about that, some of those for ours can be, you know, our executive teams, our employees, um, our sometimes even our investors, our board. And so thinking as, uh, you know, as far as it's, you know, relevant for uh, a nonprofit audience, thinking through like we get pulled in so many different directions as far as how we shape our strategy. And so really kind of approaching us and understanding what that is so that we can be most helpful to you and find the best fit. 
Um, another, and I think uh, Maddie had touched on this earlier, is that our organizations, all of the ones on this call are quite large and thus can be quite bureaucratic sometimes. I think I had the misconception that like everything would be so much more straightforward and easier at a you know private company, um, but it can be pretty bureaucratic. So, you know, getting things done or making changes or even making a payment um, sometimes can, can take quite some time. So know that it's not that we're like dismissing you or, or not trying to do it as fast as we can, but just things can take time. Um, and then the last thing I would touch on as a challenge I've had since joining uh, VMware, um, and it leads, I think, right back to the conversation around power dynamics, is the role that our teams play as far as bridging the gap between sectors. And I think uh, um, something I didn't realize is how much of a gap there is in the understanding of the nonprofit sector and vice versa. Um, and so, you know, just understanding these power dynamics, understanding the funding mechanisms, understanding how they're staffed, how, um, you know, how the operations work, uh, you know, things like the overhead myth, like the number of times I've included the overhead myth on a slide to be like, nonprofits can't spend on overhead and that being like a mind <laughs> conversation um, for a lot of my peers that are like, what are you even talking about? How is this a thing? Um, and so there's just like little nuances like this around like, yeah, like I see uh, Brittany wrote like just terminology. I, I, I would use the word capacity building. And then someone at some point was like, Miriam, are you talking about adding hardware? And I was like, what? And they're like, yeah, capacity building is adding hardware. And I was like, no, okay, we need to like <laughs> take it back. And so even language, things like that. So um, yeah, so those are some of the kind of challenges that I think would be relevant for, for this audience as you think of, you know, how, how you're engaging with us and our teams. Okay, this conversation is, we're getting a lot of questions. I'm going to try to theme them into some, some groups. I think one general theme is the kind of corporate uh, cycle slash expectations. So how do you plan for nonprofit engagements? Is it happening annually or is it happening on a multi-year phase? And then when you have these partnerships, what are your expectations of the nonprofits? Do you want them to have a full, you know, impact and comms plan? Do you want them to have a direct tie to SDGs, ESGs, any specific metrics that you're looking for when it comes to partnerships? So I think folks are really curious about those ideas of your planning cycles as well as expectations. I, I can jump in with just a couple of the things that um, you said. So um, yes, <laughs> to almost you know this is a lot of those questions. Um, we absolutely try to tie the work that we do to SDGs when we can. Um, I think I was in the process of trying to type a response to some of the questions uh, in the comments. But um, you know, I think when we think about some of the trends that we're seeing in the industry as well, um, CSR is becoming more, I'd say it's a growing field. It's, it's a, becoming more of a business imperative for organizations or corporations to really be able to demonstrate um, how they engage with communities, how they connect um, the work that we do to improving society and, and driving social impact. And within that, I think it means that we're seeing more people like uh, my fellow panelists here that have experience and practical knowledge outside of the corporate environment that they can bring and leverage to help us create and build these programs. With that comes, uh, you know, the knowledge about a lot of the pain points nonprofits face. So, you know, of course, understanding that um, when and where we can, we want to make um, donor reporting as uh, light as possible. We want to make sure we're thinking about long-term sustainability and impact. So if we can, if we have the ability, having multi-year funding, announcing our multi-year strategies publicly, I think is a fairly new thing. I think we used to um, have our strategies constantly changing. And yes, there are still politics that do change internally, you know, depending on leadership changes and other things. But I think, you know, we now announce our 10-year, 20-year commitments publicly, and it allows us to be in a better position to think through, like, how do we do multi-year funding? How do we engage with you? You know, again, if you're at the bottom of that funnel we talked about in the beginning, um, those are the types of partnerships that we would think about multi-year funding. But even I think the idea of thinking beyond the device 
is new, right? Like before we might have just said, hey, we're Dell Technologies. We can just donate a bunch of laptops or, you know, we have refurbished equipment we can provide. Now we think we have equipment we can provide, but we also want to provide, and I'm using the nonprofit term, capacity building alongside that. We want to, um, you know, we want to provide um, more engagement. We want to really get in there and have the, the deep conversations to understand uh, the digital divide and what barriers are for your community um, in a different way. And so I think hopefully we will all see that uh, more and more with the coming years. Um, but I think that that's a trend that we are seeing in general. Um, are there any other trends in this space that um, you all are noticing? I've been noticing a lot more deeper partnerships um, and multi, back to what Brittany was saying, multi-year um, partnerships and, and commitments. So um, not only in the funding space, but in, you know, volunteer engagements and, and pro bono activities, like being able to engage with partners more than just one time um, is something that I think a lot of people are, are thinking about and corporations are looking to build those meaningful relationships and the trust within, you know, organizations that we've worked with in the past um, makes it easier to have those um, engagements in the future. Awesome. And, and just a plus one to Alyssa's comment. At V2I, we actually don't have like a tech person that, that supports us on a day-to-day -day basis. But we've grouped a tech committee from various companies, including Salesforce and a couple other companies. And, and these volunteers show up every month. We give them a list of all the things that are broken. And then they go and they fix them. And then they come back and we're able to survive the, the tech gap that we have as a team. So that's a, that's a really good way to think about it. How can a tech employee help you without leaving their job? but also without having this like crazy responsibility of carrying you through like a massive uh, big project on a day-to-day -day basis. So just a couple of ways that we've been able to navigate that. Um, I think last question, if anybody has anything in the comments, do corporates see social entrepreneurs as enablers for weaving sustainability into their organizational fabric, supply and value chains, thereby adding to their profitability? So right now we're hitting on this like new and emerging trade uh, trend of not only kind of nonprofit black and white world of nonprofit corporate, but social entrepreneurship and all the good that comes with like creating wealth while doing good. Um, have your teams thought about that idea and, and what is the conversation around social entrepreneurship and partnership with social entrepreneurs? I can start there um, and say that, you know, there certainly is within our corporation and one of the trends I'm seeing is this deeper integration of social impact and social innovation with core business. And so while um, I know VMware certainly in can't speak for the others, but I suspect so. None of them were designed to be social enterprises. What I'm seeing more and more of our businesses is thinking about how can we shift some of the existing frameworks or you know institutions that exist within these corporations to make them maybe model or look more like social enterprises. So how are we thinking about our product impact, um, our investor relations, um, and you know how it impacts every single part of the business? As far as how it relates to social entrepreneurship um, or social entrepreneurs as individuals, VMware doesn't have kind of so much programming with social entrepreneurs being a B2B company. Um, but for that, I'll hand it off if others have specific engagements with social entrepreneurs. And, and it's a super new emerging field uh, that I think a lot of people are, are trying to take a stab at and I haven't seen, um, I, think, I think there is a lot of ways that those investments are happening, but they could be in acquisitions, it could be in venture capital, they could be in other corners of the corporate side that, um, that, that is uh, potentially uh, broader than this conversation today. Um, 
we are a minute away from time. We're just going to throw up one last poll, which is what was your main takeaway of today's session? If you can let us know quickly. And while we're wrapping up this poll, uh, you know, we really want to thank all of our panelists for making the time to, to join this conversation. We really appreciate your time, your skills, and your expertise. I uh, want to thank my colleague, Brianna, in the back end for making this an amazing, uh, smooth uh, uh, webinar. And then uh, lastly, I just want to let you all know that as soon as we close the Zoom, you're going to get a survey to let us know about your experience and if there's anything that we can do better um, next time. So we would love to hear from you about this facilitated conversation and how it went for you. Um, I'm really, really glad to hear that many of you are able to establish new ways or are able to think about new ways to establish partnerships take ideas home that you can implement today and get a sense of empathy for, for what's going on on the other side, because we're all dealing with a lot. And I think it's, it's just always really beneficial to see what's happening on the other side of the coin. And to the, to the one that is crushing it, cheers to you and, and go celebrate. <laughs> and uh, thank you all so much for joining this, uh, this panel discussion and for helping us celebrate uh, Pro Bono Week and all the amazing partnerships that we all get to create together. Thank you so much.